I want to welcome each of you uh, to the State of the College Address. I hope that each of you and your families are well and staying healthy. Um, congratulations on, on the fall of 2020. I wish we were doing this in person. I miss seeing each and every one of you live, shaking hands, being able to catch up one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, but I do want to welcome you to today's State of the College for the fall of 2020. I want to thank Pam Payne for all the work on the presentation. Uh, everything that you see in the presentation that's done well is, is a reflection of Pam's good work. Anything and any mistake that you see, that's my fault. Um, and I want to go ahead and get started. Um, we need to begin with the obvious. Uh, we need to start with the COVID-19 update. Um, it continues to be the central and largest challenge to everything that we're doing in our lives and in today's society. And I really want to begin there. First, what did we do? Uh, what did we at the college do? Um, so all the way back to March the 9th, which uh, is when we developed the, the crisis website. On uh, March the 13th, faculty, uh, staff, and students were notified that classes would not resume until March the 30th with online instruction. On March the 13th, uh, we determined that non-essential travel would be suspended and that our spring athletics competition would be suspended through the entire spring term. On the 20th of March, Governor Abbott issued an executive order announcing that temporary school closures, including higher education, through April the 3rd, and later extended that through the remainder of the spring semester. On the 24th of March, the city and the, the county of El Paso ordered a shelter in place order that we obviously adhered to. Uh, and then May, uh, in, in May 2020, May 18th to be exact, our CTE courses were able to return to campus to complete the spring semester hours. Uh, many of them had received incompletes and we were able to bring them back beginning in smaller groups beginning on May 18th so that they could complete those respective courses. Then on June the 25th, the Board of Trustees voted unanimous, unanimously to suspend fall athletics um, through the fall term, as well as continue in a, in a majority virtual environment for our coursework uh, for the fall of 2020, which about 92% of our courses ended up being online. We do have some heavy clinicals, um, some, some CTE courses, uh, lab intensive courses that are continuing to move forward in smaller groups adhering to social distancing with PPE uh, and in, in to ensure that we're able to complete those respective courses. Um, let me thank each and every one of you for your amazing efforts, for your flexibility, and ultimately for your continued commitment to our students. In April, we created a cross-functional safe campus task force. Uh, you see all the members of the task force there. You see what they were created for, uh, the guidelines on how to prepare the college for a safe return to campus operations. Let me start by saying we are not there yet. We do have essential services that are on campus right now, which includes our police department, uh, many of the IT individuals uh, that are working, um, adhering to social distancing, utilizing PPE equipment, including face coverings. Um, but we did create this task force to be able to provide guidance and again in a cross-functional manner of when we would have a phased return to campus operations, understanding that coursework would continue in a majority virtual environment. Um, I do want to thank the co-chairs Hector Padilla and Ivan Flores for the great work that they've done and I really want to thank Dr. Andrew Peña who's been the administ administrative liaison for the Safe Campus Task Force as well. Um, in addition, uh, we, we understood by transitioning in a two-week time period virtually everything that we did, in particular in the instructional side, that we needed to make sure that we had online assistance for um, our students. And so accommodations were made across uh, the website, um, a transition to virtual assistance, such as counseling and student services. The web team um, created consistent system for this to post the online hours, uh, a link to all of the virtual offerings. Uh, over 86,000 visits has come to this online assistance um, from the 1st of April through the 23rd of August to date. So these are just tremendous efforts by our team. We never closed. We transitioned to online services. Many thanks to Dr. Yaron 
Abraham, Abraham Hubam, Marco Fernandez, Aaron Flores, all of IT, as well as all of student services and all the different areas that transitioned quickly um, to become a majority virtual environment to protect the safety and security of our faculty, staff, and students. IT has been instrumental uh, in this, and their response has been has been extraordinary. Um, they have imaged over 1,400 laptops for students, faculty, and staff. They also contracted over 500 um, mobile Wi-Fi hotspots. Software licensing was was renegotiated for Microsoft Teams, for Microsoft Stream together, for Adobe. Um, in addition, they upgraded and granted secure access to VPN AnyConnect for all employees of the institution so that we can ensure that we were able to provide services and that people could continue in their jobs in this online environment. The health, help desk has responded to over 60,000 calls and we saw a 65% increase in IT work requests that have been processed and completed while we've been working remotely. So again, I think it's absolutely paramount that everyone understands that the college never closed. Um, continuing IT's response, uh, they increased internet bandwidth. All of us are on. Um, I'm sure you can tell that I am taping this, and broadcasting this from my home. Um, as a result, all of us are working primarily from home. And as a result, we are sharing internet broadband with all of our family members. Um, that is very taxing to the system. IT saw that as well, and they increased the bandwidth at all of our campuses to ensure that we had reliable network performance. All of our email quotas were increased, again, um, as, a, as uh, an understanding that we would be doing so much more electronically. Uh, 135 different workshops on 89 different topics um, with over 4,150 attendees on those new Microsoft applications. 1,220 uh, Microsoft Teams were created um, and over just under 10,200 sessions have occurred. Uh, they are ready also to implement a new call center, in particular at, at my request to begin with the two heaviest offices in traffic um, that are student related, which are admissions and the registrar's office, as well as financial aid. So that they are ready to implement that. I know they're partnering with Dr. Gonzalez and all of student services to be able to move that forward. So again, I want to applaud IT, all the extraordinary efforts that they have put in uh, to meet the challenge that we're dealing with, and they've done they've done it exceptionally well. Uh, a COVID-19 website. This became paramount. Um, I want to thank uh, Aaron Flores and uh, Associate Vice President Mo, uh, Mr. Heine from from marketing as well and public relations. This website was developed in coordination with external uh, relations, communications, and development. It has a website pop up. So every time the feature, so every time that you come to the website, you see that information that pops up first. So you're able to click and see the latest updates that we're providing. We have seen over 85,000 views since its launch in February, again, through August 23rd. So in just under six months, over 85,000 views that we experienced with that website. In addition, um, we developed uh, a remote toolkit website, which has been fantastic. Again, kudos to IT for do for developing the website, uh, for developing this toolkit on the website as well. Consolidate many of the technology resources to aid students, faculty, and staff. Um, this has received over 36,000 views uh, from March the 22nd through August the 23rd. Um, I would like to highlight that I was fortunate to um, be a part of a discussion with Secretary of Education DeVos. Uh, with five other community college presidents. The Department of Education had actually done research on the institution, and this is the area that they were most impressed and asked us to, to follow up and provide more context on the remote toolkit website that was developed. So kudos to everyone who worked so hard on that. Additional initiatives uh, continue to move forward, and it is important for us to do that. The ERP banner infrastructure was upgraded. Um, our ERP becomes even more important as we are in this uh, majority virtual environment. Um, online access for the CARES emergency grant request application was created. Uh, online access for emergency loans applications for students to apply for those emergency loans. We transitioned everything 
online in a very rapid environment. Um, again, ad in addition, developed faculty access reports so that they would be able to provide uh, and receive the kind of needs and technology items that they were looking at. Again, I can't thank Dr. Iran, Abraham, uh, and all of IT for the great work that they continue to do again in this virtual environment. Um, in addition, our students, uh, our students were crucial in this environment and the Department of Ed Education through the CARES Act provided significant funding for the institution to utilize. We did receive assistance from the federal government. You see those awards. Um, they totaled just under $17.9 million worth of awards. Um, let me touch on a bit, just under $8.3 million was directly a directly designated for students. We, the college is merely a pass through for this aid, ensuring that students meet the requirements and eligibility requirements as defined by the Department of Education to receive that. In addition, we received an equal amount, just under 8.3 million as the institutional award. Um, we also received just over a million dollars for minority serving institutions. Um, as an HSI, we received those resources, and then we also received through the Small Business uh, Administration a business assistant grant of over $237,000. So in total, just under $17.9 million. I know that that seems like an extraordinary amount of money. Uh, if you look at our budget last year, that is approximately 12% of our total budget. And please remember that the 8.3 million was designated directly for students and so that had to go we were merely a pass through and we were very pleased to be able to help our students and provide those resources to them um, the cares act that funds were awarded on may the 12th it took the department of education a period of time to get through that we filed all the documentation that was required we received it on may the 12th it was wired down, downloaded to the institution. Um, the institutional piece had to be related to significant changes in delivery of instruction. So anything that happened on March the 13th forward, that is what we would, could look at. And it had to relate to what we changed. So for instance, all of the laptops that I referenced that we had not ordered, the new ones that we ordered, we could utilize the institutional funding to refund the institution for those uh, protect PPE face coverings, um, all of the uh, disinfectant uh, gloves, all of those things that we could utilize for that, uh, as well as emergency grants to students. The student aid funding piece was uh, aid to students directly impacted by COVID-19. So they had to be enrolled at the time. And in addition, they had to be enrolled in some face-to-face. -face. They could not be totally online. I know it doesn't, it doesn't intuitively make sense to me either, but these were the rules the Department of Education provided that they had to have some of their coursework face-to-face -face and then be transitioned to online and be able to impact and provide that. That aid was provided to students. We received it right before the end of the spring semester, but we were able, still able to get out much of that needed aid to students um, by the end of the spring semester. In addition, looking at summer, fall, and any remaining aid that we would be able to provide to our students in the spring of 2021. They filled out a very um, a simple application that was created by financial aid. Kudos to Ms. Lopez and her team for the great work that they did on that. But students were required to fill that simple application out and indicate the kinds of challenges they were having. Was it was it child care? Was it technology? Was it transportation? Um, was it health care? Was it food insecurity? Once they filled that out, then based on what they filled out, then we had a metric that went through and, and provided. Students were eligible to receive up to $750 of CARES Act funding. Here's an update on where we are. In the spring of 2020, we had over 4,600 applications and approved um, just over 3,500, which equaled two point, a little over two and a half million dollars. In the summer, we had over 4,000 applications and 2,300 were eligible. That totaled just under $1.7 million. And in the fall, we had over 6,400 applications, of which over 4,200 were eligible, and they have to date received over $3.1 million. So in the course of receiving since May the 12th that we received it, we have awarded to over 10,100 students have received CARES Act funding, totaling just over $7.3 million. 
We have just under $1 million of CARES Act funding remaining that we will continue to distribute to students in the spring term. We have no doubt that we'll be able to exhaust that um, to be able to provide students with the funding that they truly need. Um, in addition, the institutional spending is just under $2 million to date. Um, it is uh, very much related to the PPE that we are providing for our faculty, staff, and students. Technology, as I indicated earlier, such as the laptops and the hotspots for faculty and staff, as well as students that are teaching remotely and learning remotely, and expanding that network bandwidth to accommodate that increased traffic. So to date, we have utilized just under $2 million of the institutional portion, which is equal to $8.3 million of the CARES Act. Anytime you receive any federal funding, there is going to be um, reporting requirements. And so we have to report our expenditures to the Legislative Budget Board, the LBB. We began mandatory monthly reporting on April the 5th, and we do it every month. Kudos to Vice President Shaughnessy and Associate Vice President Flores and their team, as well as all of the cabinet members that are submitting each of these um, actual and projected expenses that we have related to COVID. And so we're reporting those to, at the state level based on the federal funds that we have received. Student Enrollment Services, Dr. Gonzalez and the entire division of Student Enrollment Services, um, the first priority for us was to get to make sure that our faculty was ready to transition all of their coursework from face-to-face -to, -face to online. Once we finished um, all of those, um, uh, all of those uh, boot, Blackboard boot camps, apologies, all of those Blackboard boot camps for them to be able to utilize and be able to change and shift their courses, we then focused on ensuring that all of the direct services that we provide to students were up and running. So Dr. Gonzalez and his team created virtual, virtual offices and they transitioned to a complete online enrollment services for each respective departments. We created a one-stop shop, one-stop new model for those areas. They extended their hours from 9 a.m. all the way to 10 p.m. as well as on Saturdays. And they launched a calling campaign uh, and transitioned several of our staff members. on Angelica Sano in our office coordinated through our office. We transitioned staff members from each offices to reach out to students to see how students were doing. Um, as well as to encourage them to enroll online for the summer and or the fall term. Um, they have contacted over 40,000 students or they contacted 40,000 students in the first four months that they launched that calling campaign. So kudos for the great work on that. Um, essential services and our frontline services, um, our police officers, the police department, Chief Ramirez and all of our officers cannot thank them enough they often, my, I have two brothers that are law enforcement. Law enforcement cannot do their, their work virtually. They can't do their work online. They have to be there in person on our campuses, on all of our sites, protecting those areas, ensuring that all of those items are, are continuing to move forward. And our police officers stayed on duty during COVID-19. They continue to monitor our campus. Um, they continue to ensure that our facilities are safe. Uh, they continue to f help with community events that are still occurring um, outdoors. Obviously, we're not doing any of them indoors, but they've also assisted with ensuring that uh, Valle Verde was able to partner with the city and be a COVID-19 testing site. All of this, our police department has been at the forefront of. And so I do want to thank our police department and our officers for the great work that they have done. Financial Vice President Shaughnessy, Financial and Administrative Services, again, they also transitioned all of their areas into virtual offices, the Bursar Accounting Services. They coordinated with distance learning services, um, ensured that all of our payments uh, were able to be done online. We had these some of these services available online already, but we had many students that would do this in person. And when they didn't have a choice to do it in person, we needed to make sure that we were able to transition and train all of our bursar staff to be uh, with Blackboard access, to be able to use the laptops and microphones to communicate with students so that we would be able to do that. Um, and student assistance, they assisted over almost 2,100 students with tuition payments and accounts receivable, receivable matters through August. So kudos to Vice President Shaughnessy, AVP Flores, and all of their respective departments. I know in the spring town hall, I mentioned some of this, but I, I believe that it's so important that we need to continue to provide um, uh, 
kudos to our incredible faculty and staff uh, and students who truly care about this community. Um, Fan Chen, uh, one of our, our math faculty members, has continued and developed, uh, helped in printing 3D face masks, continues to do this work. The Philosophy Club has donated food to the Tejano Pantry to make sure that no one in our community goes hungry. The Philosophy and Social Work Clubs have, have continued to work in sewing masks. They've just done a great job of ensuring and everyone understanding how much we care about this community. Um, more good news of how of, of how committed we are to this community. Uh, we partnered with the El Paso Community Foundation for the Plaza Classic Film Festival, July 31st and August 1st, and they used the Valle Verde parking lot to show one of their films. We partner with El Pasoans Fighting Hunger to be able to distribute food at the Northwest campus. We also provided volunteers, all the volunteers, to be able to distribute food. We partnered with the Texas Division of Emergency Management to designate the Valle Verde campus as a COVID-19 testing site, and to date, over 12,000 tests have been administered at that site. So let me thank uh, AVP Mo, Dr. Gonzalez, the police department, Mr. Padilla, and so many others that have provided and showed how much we are committed to this community by providing those services. Our service lear learning program in our school store, again, they delivered over 1,200 backpack to, backpacks to area schools that were filled with school supplies for our students, for area um, ISD students. This was funded in by a grant from the El Paso Community Foundation, as well as, as resources from the college. Um, I want to thank Shannon Baez, a professor, psychology professor. She was the coordinator of the school store. I want to thank P Patricia Islas. I want to thank uh, Dr. Naomi Wa uh, Wasserman and Irene Perez, who all worked really, really hard on this to ensure that those students that have those needs were able to receive those um, backpacks and school supplies. Our chefs, Dean Webb, Chef Nickerson, Chef Guerra, um, the Chef Share Initiative has been a wonderful initiative. You may have seen it highlighted on uh, several local news stations. Do want to thank them for the great work that they did on this. This was culinary faculty, staff, and students that came together and um, they met the needs. Individuals who have been identified as food insecure in our region due to COVID-19. To date, they have prepared and delivered over 800 meals that have been provided to people in need. So cannot thank them enough for stepping up and truly making an impact in our community. Want to transition out of COVID-19, and I know that that's taking much of our attention, and, we'll, and rightfully so, and we will continue to monitor that. And I'll come back later in the presentation and touch on what we're monitoring and what will determine uh, when we recommend to the Board of Trustees a return to campus and the metrics that we're looking at. But I want to touch on the business of the college does not stop. Uh, the initiatives that we're implementing, the student success initiatives, all of the great work that we're doing. I want to sh shift gears and talk about those college initiatives for a period of time. The economic, economic impact of community colleges has been, this is pre-COVID, uh, pre-pandemic, has been extraordinary in our state. There you see on your screen the number of certificates and degrees awarded statewide by all 50 community colleges. You see nearly 50,000 certificates in, and degrees in liberal arts. You see the next highest level of health professionals in all those clinical services and the thousands and thousands of degrees and certificates that community, the 50 community colleges across the state provide. We continue to be the most, the, 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 the best value in higher education in the state of, ed, in the state of Texas. We are the fourth lowest tuition, Texas, for community colleges. We rank the fourth lowest among the 50 states for community college tuition and fees. And then you see the wages uh, by educational attainment. You see that as a state, those students that have college up to an associate degree receive just under $8,400 additional revenue, additional salaries, every single year by completing coursework through the community college. And you see that there's almost 3.25 million individuals in our state that have um, some college, a certificate and or an associate degree. And their impact on the state is $27.2 billion. So this is statewide. Let's talk a little bit about, about 
our region about El Paso Community College. We have EPCC alone had $192 million impact in our region, including employing more than 2,000 El Pasoans whose annual combined salaries was just under $92 million. Um, the, our students that have completed their differential by completing uh, certificates degrees in college is almost $6,100 annually every single year. And the 72,000 residents in our community that have a certificate and associate degree or some college more than high school graduation, they earn $440 million annually amongst those 72. In addition, we rank fifth amongst two-year colleges nationally in upward economic mobility. So 37% of our students that start with us at the lowest economic quintile move up two quintiles after taking coursework and completing certificates and degrees with EPCC. So tremendous work, kudos to each of you. The work that we do matters tremendously for the social economic mobility of the population that we are fortunate to serve. You've heard me say it, you're probably tired of me saying it, but the more you learn, the more you earn and, and the less likely you are to be unemployed. Again, this is pre-pandemic, but you see that at that time, the unemployment rate was less than was right at 3%. But if you earn an associate degree, it was below that at 2.7. And every credential you earn beyond that, your likelihood of being unemployed continues to fall. And then you also see the uh, the earnings, the median uh, weekly earnings um, for individuals that have these credentials. So it continues to be more and more important, and it will continue to be so. The Bridges to the Baccalaureate uh, grant with NIH. This is a partnership that we have had, a, a partnership with UTEP that we have had providing biomedical research opportunities and tutoring services all the way since 1993. This newest five-year subgrant renewal, uh, which goes from August of this year through July of 2025, um, is $310,000 annually or just over an, a total award of um, one and a half million dollars. Kudos to each, to everyone that's involved, Dr. Amaya, Dr. Maldonado, uh, Rosalia Ortega, and we'd be remiss if we didn't continue to think of the great work that Dr. Lanuti, who we tragically lost, who was so involved in this program. Um, he was the program coordinator from 1997 until 2020. Um, you see the outcomes of this program. It continues to do great work in our community, and it's a great partnership with UTEP. Um, our STEM Grow uh, initiatives, again, another wonderful partnership that we have with UTEP. With UTEP. This partnership um, is to grow Hispanic student success and facilitate transitions between the college and the university and increase graduation rates in STEM education. Uh, this grant is $1.7 million grant. Um, we, as you can see, that we've had over 1,000 students, 466 have transferred to UTEP, and 402 have graduated. Uh, kudos to Dr. Amaya, uh, Dr. Garcia, um, uh, Mariano Olmos, uh, Professor Chen, um, Professor um, Hoken. Uh, and again, this was another effort that Dr. Lanuti was instrumental in and continued to do great work in. Um, continuing on to the Makerspace Lab at the Valle Verde campus that's opening this fall and is now actually in the process of opening. So first, What's a makerspace lab? Um, so it's a place where we can come together to make, to learn, and to explore tools and equipment that varies uh, from no tech to very high tech. Um, and it's for everyone. It is for everyone affiliated with the college, for our students, for our faculty, for our staff. You see the services that are offered in this particular area. Um, and again, I want to thank Dr. Amaya for, for this being his vision to create this. I, I want to th thank Calvert Boyle, Boyle and again, Professor Chen for the great work that they've done. But this is going to add another feature to our campus. I know that we're primarily virtual right now, but we will get to come back to campus and this facility will be available. Uh, and you see them already, the kinds of things as far as even face shields and PPE that they're able to make in these makerspace areas. Our College Credit for Heroes grant. Um, let me congratulate Dr. Pagel. 
uh, on this great work. Um, this is a grant that is funded uh, through the Texas Workforce Commission, and it's really implemented or awarded to implement prior learning assessment or company-based education projects. So this is uh, ensuring that our, our soldiers our men and women in uniform that once they transition out of uniform, that the skills that they bring, amazing skills that they bring, that we're able to provide them with credit for those skills. Uh, and so we want to eliminate those obstacles in any of our veterans um, in attaining a degree and attaining an award from the institution. So again, kudos uh, to Dr. Pagel and her team for moving forward with this particular grant. Um, uh, the C campus grant. This is $250,000 annual grant that we received from the Department of Education. It was renewed for the second of four years for us. Um, over $190,000 currently available for student for child care subsidies. We certainly understand that that is one of the challenges that many students uh, have as child care once they're enrolled with us. Uh, Full-time child care is available to all EPCC students that are enrolled in at least one course, and it subsidizes anywhere for, from 50 to 75 percent of the weekly cost. So kudos to Dean Primovich uh, and to Ms. Lopez in financial aid for ensuring that we had this and move this forward. The TRIO SSP, uh, the Student Support uh, Services Grant, this is a fantastic uh, grant that we receive, Student Support Services Program, SSP grant. Uh, this is th over three and a half million dollar grant. It's over seven hundred thousand dollars annually. It was a new five year grant that impacts first generation college student success. Kudos to Ms. Rodriguez, uh, our Director of Student Success, as well as Cynthia Velasco, Velasco our Manager of Student Support Service, Services Program. It serves 600 students. Um, it is the largest SSP grant award in Texas and the eighth largest in the nation. Congratulations. It shows that we truly have a need and we're stepping up to meet that need. Texas Workforce Commission and Skills Development Skills Grants. Uh, to date, we have received another $1.6 million that was awarded. You see them listed there. Uh, the Manufacturing Consortium that received over $184,000. Uh, the Hospitals of Providence, um, just under $700,000. We had a grant for a COVID special initiative that was um, nearly 300,000, and then the DISH network of over 350,000. So great, great work that's happening here. Um, I, I do want to congratulate Dr. Carmen Aguilera uh, Gurner for the great work that she and her team have done this. And as you can see, we've trained 715 employees through the, the TWC Skills Development Fund grant. So congratulations on those. Our apprenticeship grants, um, over $305,000 in apprenticeship grants have been awarded. Uh, you see one of them there for over 155,000, uh, the 215 apprentices and over 40,500 training hours. In addition, you see the one from the um, American Association of Community Colleges and the U.S. Department of Labor uh, of over, of over 150,000. Again, kudos and congratulations to Dr. Dr. Aguilera Gurner and her team for getting this and moving these forward. Um, our Contract Opportunity Center. Um, so I'd like to highlight some of the great work that they did over this last year. Um, over 360 uh, businesses that were counseled, um, over 1,880 um, hours that were counseling hours that were provided. They retained over 9,300 jobs that were either created or retained, um, 137 different clients and businesses that received awards. And you see the amazing impact. The award total of 1,706 total awards totaling over $460 million is the value of those. So uh, thank you so much, Mr. Admandaris, for the great work that you and your team does on this. Um, our Small Business Development Center, uh, Mr. Ferguson and your team, congratulations on another fantastic year. 122 clients that were assisted with disaster-related business advising, um, and you see that it was over 1,170 
full-time jobs supported that received disaster-related training, and that amounted to over $4.25 million uh, that resulted as a uh, that resulted as a uh, as a result of this work. Pardon me. Uh, fantastic work. Wait, uh, thank you so much for the great work, Mr. Ferguson. Um, the CAMP grant, the College Assistant Migrant Program. Um, this was another $275,000 that was awarded. Um, it's designed to assist no less than 40 qualifying migrant workers and or family members to enroll and complete the, their first year of college and transition into the second year. I want to thank Dr. Andres Muro. Uh, since 2016, we have uh, the college has awarded an average of $270,000 annually in federal funds. And since 2017, 140 migrant students have completed one year of college and started their second. So kudos for the great work on this. The National Institute of Food and, uh, and Agriculture, NIFA grant. Uh, this was another $185,000 plus dollars that was granted from the USDA. A four-year grant that supports culinary arts program students through recruitment, retention, and impact on their graduation and upon their post-graduation career. So kudos to Dean Webb and Chef Nickerson for leading this effort. Uh, congratulations and, and continue the great work. Um, the Rise to the Challenge Bridge Program, this continues to set the standard for undergraduate research experience, in particular at the community college. Um, I want to thank Dr. Alvarez for the great work and for the long-standing work that has gone through the Rise to the Challenge Bridge Program. Um, this year, they have students developing their projects in collaboration with our partners at UTEP and NMSU with a focus on COVID-19 and antibiotic resistance research topics. So very timely, very intense research, and it just shows that our students are willing to step up and meet the expectations and rise to the, to the expectations that we have established for them. Congratulations, Dr. Alvarez. Um, I wanna make sure that everyone realizes, obviously this in this year of transition, I wanna congratulate Dr. Wilson on completing her first year as president of UTEP. Um, and early on, within the first uh, two months of her being on the job, at her request, we doubled down and recommitted. To, we renewed our commitment to the, the incredible partnership, nationally known partnership, um, as the as the two year, the the premier two year, four year partnership in all of the United States. And upon her arrival and now in leading the university, we wanted to make sure that our community understood. That, our, that we were recommitting to this incredible partnership and that we were going to work hard to continue to see the great results that ultimately benefit the students and community members of the greater El Paso area. So we are excited about that and we will continue to work hard on our partnership that will facilitate success for this region. Dean Badillo and all of the dual credit and early college high school team Congratulations, as you see, um, we opened a significant number of new partnerships for, for early college high schools and PTEC uh, partnerships. We're now up to 20 as of this fall uh, that are all the way back to our original mission, early college high school that started in 2006 to our most recent one in partnership with Tornillo this fall. Um, so kudos to you for the great work. Um, we continue to expand early college high schools with our partners at ISDs. Um, we have seen the fruits and the results, the fantastic student success results of these partnerships. Again, working with the district, the college, and even continuing to work with UTEP on the establishment of these. So kudos again to Dean Badillo and all of that team. Uh, in addition, we're in a planning year. Uh, for seven additional. As you can see, we're going to be working with El Paso Independent School District, uh, again with Clint and San Elizario. We're looking at additional PTEC, early college high schools, as well as one traditional. So kudos to each of you. Uh, we go through annually planning. We do not just open them. It is a very syst a systematic approach to how we open these new early college high schools. And the results are obvious. What you see in our results um, are that we continue to be uh, the premier provider of early college high schools. Over 72% of our early college high school students receive their associate degrees before they graduate from high school. Uh, this now entails 
almost 3,800 graduates since, since we started our early college high schools. Um, the national average continues to be approximately 22%. So we are almost 50% above the national average. Again, setting those expectations of how well our students do. Um, we also hosted professional development continues to be important. And so we hosted the fourth uh -huh. annual dual credit summer convening. Uh, and had a keynote speaker from the Community College Research Center at Columbia University, Ms. Uh, Dr. John Fink, who's a senior research associate. Uh, so I want to thank Dean Badillo, Vice President Smith, and all of the deans and all of the faculty members and all of the services that help um, with our early college high schools. Um, we believe, I firmly believe, that college begins in kindergarten. And so what we're doing is we're, we're adopting those elementary schools, including those kindergarten classes. We started this back in 2013, and we are now up to 10 um, um, elementary school adoptions. You see that this last year we included um, Benito Martinez Elementary at Fort Hancock, Tornillo Elementary, and Anthony Elementary. Um, all of those were new elementary schools, so we now have 10, 10 elementary schools that we've adopted. And... 10 different school districts. I want to thank Angelica Sano in our office, as well as student enrollment services staff who continue to move and lead this forward. The Northwest Campus, the Jenna Welch and Laura Bush Community Library continues to do great work in that, uh, in that community of the district, in the Northwest area of the district, in the Canatillo area. I want to thank Laura Lee Ambris and all of the Northwest Library staff for the great work that they're doing. 262 children registered for multiple class and the duplicated count for all of the uh, programs that we had was well over a thousand students. Um, the, the library staff prepared over a thousand supply bags that were curbside picked up by the parents. And so kudos to all of you for continuing to move this forward. As you can see, it was an online summer library program. So kudos again for that. Phi Theta Kappa is the most prestigious honor society for community colleges. And our chapter has done, um, the Omega Gamma chapter has done a phenomenal job. Um, you see that Dr. Perez, the faculty advisor, received the Texas Region Horizon Award. Uh, she also received um, the District 1 Hall of, Hall of Honor. So kudos, Dr. Perez. Uh, the Texas Region uh, Five Star Level Award was, was granted to us, and our College Project and Honors uh, in Action received an award as well. Kudos to our Phi Theta Kappa. Um, chapter, they continue to do a tremendous job. And kudos to them. Uh, continue to make us proud. Well done. Um, we have to continue to develop new programs to serve our community. Uh, so these community, these programs will continue to move forward. Vice President Smith and the deans and faculty have developed four new additional programs. Uh, you see them listed there. The Administrative Medical Assistant program, Level 1 Certificate, Court reporting level two, the real time closed captioning, uh, and you're seeing right now that someone is is doing is is providing um, services for the hearing impaired. Uh, sometimes that closed captioning is also a level two certificate has been developed, and an interior design kitchen and bath level two certificate has been developed. These are all in in moving forward, and we're pending agency approvals from SAC COC and the Department of Education, as well as the coordinating board. But we continue to provide the kinds of programs uh, that our community needs to move forward. Um, the Stay Strong Online Tutoring Services, Ms. Rodriguez and her team, they transitioned approximately 35% of their tutoring was online. They went from 35% to 100%. Uh, this is free academic tutoring online through Blackboard Collaborate. Um, their hours are from 6 a.m. to 2 a.m. They only take four hours off a day, seven days a week, um, and they continue to move this forward. Um, students are overwhelmingly positive about these, about these services, so thank you so much for providing those services online. Uh, another program that was led by, by Ms. Rodriguez, um, Connecting the Dots, uh, an annual gathering of tutors and academic support staff I was fortunate to participate in this year's uh, program, again, virtually. Um, kudos for providing that. It was really an effort to connect, the, uh, to connect the tutors, the academic support and resources that would help us benefit our students more. 
Uh, so I'm very, very pleased with the great work that they're doing. Congratulations and thank you. Um, court reporting partnerships with Socorro Independent District. Um, so kudos to Ms. Luna, uh, our accounting professor, as well as um, uh, Bertha Preto, a court and conference reporting professor. They partnered with uh, Socorro's Independent School District and in particular America's High School uh, to move forward with a court reporting partnership so that these students, the fall cohort one, uh, eight students that went through that successfully completed their first course. Um, now we're moving into cohort two, and they're going to be continuing to work on an associate's degree in court reporting. So again, tremendous job and an opportunity for these students. Our competency-based education summer institute, um, Dr. Pagel again led this effort. It was hosted on June 23rd through the 26th, obviously online, and it was in partnership with TSTC. Um, 35 participants from across the state and, and country, which included 20 members from EPCC, uh, 20 faculty members. So congratulations on moving that forward. Um, we have programs that, uh, that are incredibly important and that the pass rates on their exams are incredibly important for us to continue these programs. And I'd like to call out three such programs, the dental hygiene, the medical lab technolo uh, technicians, and the surgical technology program. Um, Elia Mendez, Veronica Dominguez, and um, Cynthia Rivera, all professors that lead those programs, they each had 100% pass rates. Congratulations to our faculty, to Dean Hajar, and to those 35 students that achieved 100% pass rate. Dr. Linda Brown, our, our director for the Leadership Academy and her team have done a tremendous job. Uh, the 15th anniversary class completed. It was comprised of 50 faculty and staff. They completed that uh, 774 to date since 2004 that the program was launched, um, have participated. This year, they developed the 50th anniversary time capsule uh, that I'm going to touch on shortly. But congratulations on 15 years of incredible uh, work that the Leadership Academy has done. You see that they're focused on succession planning model uh, for other institutions as well. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the time capsule that they developed. Um, this was showcase its debut at the Valle Verde campus. Uh, for the camp for the classroom building that's opening in spring of 2021. You see the theme displays. Um, they're going to be installed every six months, but they really wanted, wanted to do a, a 50 years of history. Uh, they included toys, music, technology, sports, arts, literature, and more that was included in this particular time capsule. And we look forward to continuing to monitor that and to opening that time capsule in the future. Our diversity and inclusion program. Let me take a moment to take a sip of water. Um, our commitment to diversity is it continues to be steadfast and true. And I want to thank Ms. Olga Chavez and the diversity committee uh, for the great work that they're doing and all of the staff that has participated in this. You see the safe zone training um, that we're offered at least twice a month. We had 28 faculty tra trainers, and you see where they came from. 140 employees have been trained and have received those certificates. So thank you so much for that safe zone training, Ms. Chavez. Uh, another program that they lead is the 2020 Diamond Awards. Um, this is a program that recognized this year 38 EPCC women uh, leaders. Over the last 12 years, just under 500, 488 to be exact, have been recognized with the Diamond Award. And um, Ms. Sanchez, a member of our board, uh, was the keynote speaker, and she gave a very moving um, speech that I was fortunate to attend. Uh, it was a great program. Kudos, uh, Mrs. Chavez, and, and the entire committee. Hispanic Heritage, which actually this year's Hispanic Heritage is, is kicking off today. Um, and it kicked off just uh, this month as well. I do want to highlight last year as well. Um, the mentor's dinner, the keynote speaker was Dr. Uh, Ellen Ochoa. She was the first Latina in space, and she is a past director of NASA. Um, it was a fantastic program. It, they, they continue to raise money. They provided 
uh, awarding of a $1,000 scholarship for the third year in a row. Um, several scholarships that were awarded. You see three. You see many different students holding those scholarships, and um, congratulations to each of them. You see this year's uh, festival again that started on September 16th and will go through October 15th. This is the 19th annual Hispanic Heritage Month at EPCC. Um, and the theme this year is be proud of your past and embrace the future. So certainly um, great job that they're doing and look forward to the celebration that they will have over the course of the next month. Um, Black History Month, wonderful program that was held in February. As you can see, Gary Bledsoe, the president of the Texas chapter of the NAACP, he was our keynote speaker. Um, they celebrated and presented awards to the Honorable Judge um, John Chapman, um, Ms. Baby Ruth Boswell, as well as um, the college's very own cross-country marathon team. So thrilled at the great program that they hold um, during Black History Month. In addition, they will be moving forward with celebrating Indigenous Peoples Month, um, celebrating and recognizing Indigenous Peoples Month in October and November. You see the listing of the great things that will begin October 24th and will run through November 19th. Again, kudos to Mrs. Chavez and the entire committee for celebrating all types of diversity that we certainly value uh, and cherish at El Paso Community College. Salute to the Arts continues to move forward. Uh, the El Paso Community College K-12 through Art Exhibit was held in 2019. It featured over 1,238 pieces of student art from El Paso area school districts, as well as parochial schools and home schools. Uh, the reception was attended by 450 students, parents, and teachers. I want to thank uh, Ms. Rudnick, Janine Rudnick, for the great work on this area. In addition, the 12th annual EPCC Literary Fiesta continues to move forward and was held. Great events that were held in October. And the 25th uh, annual Chopin Festival, uh, which was founded by the late Dr. Lucy Scarborough, who was an amazing faculty member, um, uh, one of the one of the founders of El Paso Community College, and great work that she did. Um, we're very sorry that we lost her this year, but we're indebted to the great vision that she had that continues to carry forward. I want to thank Vice President Shaughnessy, um, who is the administrative liaison for the Chopin Festival, and she does a tremendous tremendous job with that. Um, our Classified Staff Association, great work by uh, President, President Gaither and the entire CSA um, of really contributing and having the annual turkey drive this past year. Um, they received over $800 in donations as well as nine turkeys. They were able to deliver 60, 63 turkeys that were bought with those donations and 21 that were distributed to three of our El Paso area organizations. Um, 2020 will be this first year that they will not be able to have it, obviously due to COVID-19, um, but we will make sure that we continue to gather donations to be able to provide um, uh, opportunities for members in our community that need these kinds of donations. So kudos to the CSA. Thank you for the great work. The PSA, the Professional Staff Association, Ms. Uh, President Alarcon and all of the PSA, um, they do a great job of giving back to our community as well. Um, they, they, they indicate that they work hard and play hard in raising money for student scholarships and showing the college spirit that they have as well. They held multiple karaoke events in 2019. I'm glad I fortunately was out of town and could not participate because um, my voice would not have, uh, they, they would have raised less money, I'm sure, if if I had participated. But they continue to do that to benefit our students. And congratulations and kudos to you for that great work. And as you can tell from the pictures, they also had a really good time doing it. Uh, I really, really want to thank um, Associate Vice President Mo and, and, and Mr. Heine and the entire marketing team for the great work that they do. You can see that over 90% of our re news releases received coverage. There was more than 432 stories that were published about the college. They had 570 events featured on television stations in both English and Spanish. Um, we're featured an average of 16 times per week in our local news. Uh, and kudos to that entire team 
um, for the great work that you've seen. Um, and as we transition in 20, transition in 2020, you also see that the social media following is up by 20%. That will only continue to rise as we're doing so much work online now. Um, another area in AVP Mo's uh, portfolio, the foundation uh, for EPCC, Dr. Gross and the foundation board has done another tremendous job. Um, you see that just under 1,500 scholarship recipients since 2010 that have graduated. 51% uh, of these uh, graduated in three years or less. 325, 324 scholarships were awarded in, in the 2019-2020 timeframe for a total of $271,000. 107 of these uh, foundation scholarship recipients graduated during this year. Uh, and 70% demonstrated a financial need. So kudos, Dr. Gross and the Foundation Board for the great work that you continue to do. Um, additional work for the, from the Foundation. Uh, Course Hero, uh, this was a grant that was awarded through Excellencia. It was a $10,000 um, grant that we received. 51 students received many grants from this funds. The Stay Strong, oh, they awarded $15,000 to date. 75 students received many grants from this particular area. And the, and the El Paso Community College Care Chef Share Fund um, has raised over $700 and continues to, to provide those resources to our community. You see these emergency run, uh, funds that we receive contributions um, from Wells Fargo giving us $10,000, uh, the foundation itself providing $5,000 and on down the line of great community partners who have continued to provide resources to the foundation for our students. So you see the testimonials from our students. It's really important that we continue to provide resources through our foundation. Thank you, Dr. Gross and the board for the great work. Uh, our grants management team, Mr. Elliott and the grants management team, if you look at the great work that they have done, an overview, 26 new grant awards that totaled over $22.5 million. You see the prior year, the renewals, you see the 61 grants that are in progress, the eight that are under development, and the 17 that were submitted. All told, this is over $75 million of grants. Kudos, Dr. Mr. Elliott and the grants team for the great work on that. Um, they are so important for our students and for the college as a whole. Thank you for that great work. Um, our 50th anniversary. Um, we um, celebrated our 50th anniversary, and I want to thank the co-chairs of that, uh, Carrie Moe, who's our Associate Vice President for External Relations, Communications, and Development, and Ms. Uh, Lisa Elliott, who's a Professor of Mass Communications at the VV campus. Fantastic job of leading that effort, and everyone who was involved in the 50th anniversary Kudos and congratulations uh, for the great work that occurred. Um, we had we held a retiree reception uh, and luncheon. Uh, Dr. Graham had been pushing for a long time for this to move forward. Uh, we were able to finally move it forward. Uh, again, want to thank uh, Associate Vice President Mo for the great work on this, Dr. Graham for this. This was uh, trustee driven. Uh, really wants to ensure that our retirees are engaged and they, they gave so much of their lives uh, and their careers to the college that we continue to keep them involved. You see several board members that are there in those pictures. Um, that was that reception was held in our office on November the 19th. Uh, and we're really looking at um, if, if our community has recovered, that this is a strategy for, for any future bond that may, we may look at and keeping our former employees, our retirees engaged in the great work that the college is doing so that they can continue to serve as ambassadors for our institution. Uh, the NJCAA National Championships were held uh, here in El Paso. This was the last signature event for the 50th anniversary. Um, I want to thank um, our athletic director uh, and coach in Ahosa, as well as AVP Mo for the great work that they did in hosting this. Um, all of our community sponsors, uh, the championship committee, as well as our student staff and community volunteers for hosting this. As you can see, over 125 athletes from 15 different schools participated in this. Congratulations, you see Chair of the Board Haggerty, 
welcoming everyone for that 19th annual NGCAA Half Marathon Championships that were held and hosted right here in El Paso. Kudos to each of you for that. Our 50th anniversary commencement that we held in December of 2019, our commencement speaker speaker was former Texas State Senator and EPCC founding leader, uh, former Senator Joe Christie was our commencement speaker. He did a tremendous job, amazing gentleman who indicated that creating El Paso Community College was his greatest legislative achievement. Uh, He's saying that 50 years later, he sees how much it has impacted our community and we're so fortunate to have him come back and provide that 50th anniversary. So thank you, Senator Christie. Thank you for your vision. And I hope that you continue to be proud of what the amazing faculty, staff and students of EPCC has been able to do over these last 50 years. The master plan. So many people are involved in the master plan. Um, So many faculty, staff um, continue to be involved, administrators in this. Uh, But I want to thank Vice President Shaughnessy. I want to thank Mr. Gallardo. I want to thank every division and our campus uh, deans for the great work that they've done on on this um, master plan that is coming to fruition, that is coming to completion. We already have three projects that are up and already operating that we opened over the course of the last year. And now we have three more that are coming online that I'd like to touch on. But going back, the Trans Mountain Campus expansion, we had that grand opening on the 4th of September of 2019. Um, That was a 25,000 square foot expansion, a beautiful facility uh, that students began using it as if it had been there the whole time. And that's what we want is we want that use. Uh, The TTC, the Transportation Training Center at the Via Verde campus, we had that grand opening on November 20th. It is a state-of-the-art 38,000 square foot new facility that is absolutely amazing. Um, So kudos to everyone who was involved in that. We're so excited to have it up and running. Uh, And it is is a gorgeous facility and students are utilizing it um, tremendously. So very, very happy with that. Uh, The Northwest Campus Expansion a 35,000 square foot new facility. We held that grand opening on February 5th. Uh, It was a snow day. We had a late start for EPCC. It snowed that morning. Uh, One of the last uh, big events that we had in person uh, pre-pandemic, but we were so thrilled to have that grand opening. It is a state-of-the-art gorgeous facility that opened. I want to thank Dr. Denna, the campus dean, uh, as Mr. Uxer was so proud of that, that's in his district as well as our entire board um, for that outstanding grand opening that we had. Um, Coming soon, very, very soon, um, is the Mission Del Paso expansion. This is a 60,000 square foot, absolutely amazing, gorgeous facility that you see there lit up. You see the picture that's lit up there at night. Um, It completely fits that mission uh, uh, motif that we have at the MDP campus. Uh, It is absolutely a a fantastic building that I have driven by and so look forward to that. It'll be ready for the fall mini-mester, which begins on October 19th. Obviously, we won't have a lot of in-person classes there, but as soon as we get to the post-pandemic, we will be utilizing that that outstanding facility um, in the very near future. Two more, uh, the Valle Verde classroom, the STEAM building, it is a 101,000 square foot facility. Let me just point out that that picture is an actual picture of the building. I have never seen a building turn out to be almost exactly like the renderings that the architects provided. Uh, if you go back and see pri- previous presentations, I we were provided a rendering that looked exactly like the picture that you're seeing of the actual building. Um, this is a, a state-of-the-art facility that we can't wait to open. It should open towards the end of the fall term uh, and absolutely look forward to that three-story, 101,000-square-foot building opening. And the last project that we will get through is the the Rio Grande campus um, classroom and parking garage. This is the largest 
um, by far the largest project that we are building. Uh, it is the most complex given that it is in a very urban downtown setting as well. And um, we have had delays with this particular project, some that were outside of our control, many that were outside of our control, but we're certainly excited. Uh, and this building will be ready um, to go in the spring semester. Uh, so really looking forward to that as well uh, and can't wait for that to open. IT plays an instrumental role in, in the master plan as well. Um, the network systems, the technical support services, all of the media services, the smart classrooms that go into those. Um, IT is responsible for the, the design and developing specs for the IT in infrastructure for all of our new facilities, including these six projects. Um, all of the AV and technology enhanced classrooms, all those smart classrooms that are going in there. And they're currently supporting over 7,000 desktops, 2,000 printers, and over 3,500 mobile devices throughout the district. So Dr. Iron, you and your team, thank you so much for that. Um, we're not only building the building state of the art, but the technology within those new buildings will also be state of the art. Um, just because we're building new buildings doesn't mean that uh, the buildings that we currently have and the projects that we have don't have to continue to move forward. So let me thank Mr. Lobato, Mr. Torres and their teams at the physical plant for the great work that they've done. As you can see, all of the projects throughout all of our campuses that have occurred, district-wide items, um, Northwest campus, you see some items that were there that the chiller was replaced, um, the evacuation chairs installed district-wide, projects at the Trans Mountain campus, um, projects, several different projects at the Via Verde campus, uh, at the Mission campus, uh, again, in the early college high school chiller was replaced, the restroom renovations at Trans Mountain, all of these projects continue. And I want to thank Mr. Lobato and Mr. Torres and their team for completing all of these projects. And there will be many more that will continue. That's another essential service. These, um, these staff members have continued to move forward. Uh, they've continued with projects that they will continue even in the, in the pandemic, obviously adhering to social distancing, utilizing PPE and safety uh, requirements, but those projects will continue. Let me touch on some celebrations. Um, we have much to celebrate at El Paso Community College. Um, we, the last signature event of the 50th anniversary I mentioned earlier, uh, and let me congratulate um, our national champion Tejanos who finished first at, uh, in that meet and our Tejanas who were runner ups in that meet. Uh, congratulations to um, uh, AD Inojosa and the coaches fantastic job. You continue to uh, do a tremendous job of ensuring that these students, uh, that these student athletes not only compete, but are victorious at a national level. Congratulations on that. And you also ensure, as you indicate, um, uh, A.D. and Ojosa, that they are scholar athletes. And so you see that they were the NGC AA Academic Team of the Year. Uh, you see the GPAs for each of our respective teams all six teams with GPAs ranging from 3.12 all the way up to 3.68. Um, fantastic work making sure that these truly are student athletes, or as you would say, scholar athletes. You see our, our baseball academic first team members that are listed there, um, not just from baseball, but you see our cross country and half marathon team members that were um, first team with 4.0s, you see the second team with GPAs that range from 3.8 to 3.99. And our third team members with uh, GPAs that range from 3.6 to 3.79. Congratulations and well done. Not only champions on the, on the track and field, but champions in the classroom. Um, some institutional recognitions um, from across the institution. Um, as you see, we once again received in 2019 as well as in 2020, the HEED Award, uh, the Higher Education Excellence and Diversity Award from Insight into Diversity Magazine, our commitment to our men and women in uniform. So we are once again the Victory of Media Military Friendly Award Gold Medal College. Um, the Minority Access Incorporated, we received um, that award as well. 
We qualified as one of the 150 top community colleges in the nation for the Aspen Prize once again. Um, we also received, as you can see, um, the financial reporting uh, by Government Finance Association of the United States and Canada, the GFOA award. And you see that once again, um, and I'm going to transition from this one into this one right here, we are once again the top community college in the nation for awarding associate degrees to Hispanic students. This is the 15th year in a row that we have achieved that. That is a tribute to all of our faculty and staff, your dedication, your commitment, and your passion for facilitating student success for the students that we're fortunate to serve. Um, so we were once again featured on the cover. So kudos to each of you. Uh, Minority Access Award. For the second year in award, uh, second year in a row, Minority Access Incorporated awarded the Diversity Award to EPCC and to two faculty members, Dr. Escamilla and Dr. Cianelli. Congratulations to each of you and uh, for receiving that award. We're very proud. Um, some national recognition for our marketing and public relations team, uh, AVP Mo, Mr. Heine, and the entire marketing and PR team. Uh, they were recognized for the 50th anniversary campaign. You see all of the different um, items that they were recognized for from the timeline, the community relations, the fundraising gala, the banner campaign, even the calendar. Congratulations on all of the awards and the, and the well-deserved recognition. The College Excellence Awards, I want to recognize um, Manuela Gomez, uh, Viridiana Fernandez, Lisbeth uh, Ragona, uh, Rachel Murphy, Dr. Christian Servine, and um, Maria Sanchez for receiving uh, the Faculty Excellence Awards. Congratulations to each of you. I want to congratulate um, our librarian, uh, Kristen Gail Sanchez, for receiving the Minnie, Pi Minnie Stevens Piper Faculty Achievement Award, and Associate Vice President Mo uh, for receiving the President's Excellence Award for the tremendous job of leading the 50th anniversary, as well as all of the other amazing work that you achieve on a daily basis. So thank you both for that wonderful uh, achievement. Uh, employees of the Year, uh, Ms. Jackie Gaines was the professional staff full-time employee of the year. Uh, Mr. Tommy Gonzalez was the professional staff part-time employee of the year. Uh, you see that John Salas was our classified staff full-time employee of the year. And Leticia Montoya was our classified staff part-time employee of the year. Congratulations for that recognition. Want to highlight Imelda Elizarde. Um, for successfully completing the Data and Decisions Academy. Um, well done. And you see the coursework that was completed, um, the high level statistical uh, foundational statistics for decision support, as well as longitudinal tracking and institutional research. Congratulations uh, for completing that academy. Well done. Very proud of that achievement as well. Um, successful external audits and financial statements. Vice President Shaughnessy, Associate Vice President Flores, um, well done. Congratulations on, on the results from um, our last audit that was completed, um, that uh, or the audit for the fiscal year that ended August 31st, 2019. It was an unmodified, or as we indicate, a clean opinion. Um, there was no material weakness or significant deficiencies noted. Congratulations uh, on this. Uh, no non-compliance with any requirements of major federal and state programs and also being in compliance with Public Funds Investment Act. So congratulations on that. It's incredibly important that everyone knows uh, that we are always in compliance and that our audits continue to be um, uh, very well done and in a manner that's consistent with what is expected for us. Let me touch, let me have one more drink of water as I continue. Um, uh, trust me, we're in the home stretch now of this presentation. And let me, um, let me talk a little bit about the path forward. So first, let me thank Dr. Penley and Ms. Frescas for leading the efforts in our new strategic plan that will be unveiled. Um, many of you, in fact, we had uh, the board who provided a significant uh, input on the new strategic plan. It came back to cabinet, uh, went out to the greater college community, 
to provide input for this uh, and that new strategic plan from 2021 through 2025 or 2026 will continue to move forward. Um, again, want to thank Ms. Frescas and, uh, and the institutional planning that led this effort, uh, and there'll be more details that will be shared. Um, but we were just completing our, our strategic plan that ended in 2020, and we are now ready to go with our new strategic plan. Uh, uh, we are moving quickly with our SAC COC reaccreditation process, our reaffirmation of the accreditation timeline. Um, you see we are part of the um, class of 2023 uh, this December in a virtual environment at the SAC COC uh, conference. We will go through orientation um, on March 1st of 2020. The compliance certification report is due and that's actually March 1st of 2022. Uh, uh, what you pardon me of 2020 that was accurate um, the offsite review will begin um, in April and May of 2022 in summer of 2022 we will receive the focus report in the fall of 2022 we will have an on-site visit um, I'm very hopeful that they will be on site I will be participating in an on-site visit virtually this fall um, based on the pandemic and what we're dealing with, those have all been transitioned at least through the end of the fall virtually, but we anticipate that in, by fall of 22 that those will be on site. In the spring of 23, we have an opportunity to respond to that on site if there needs to be a response, and then the board will make a decision on our reaffirmation process in the summer of 2023. Again, kudos to Dr. Penley and everyone at the college. Dr. Penley is leading this as our vice president for research accreditation and planning, but every single member at the institution partakes in the reaffirmation process. So please continue the great work, whether it be on student learning outcomes um, from our faculty and program learning outcomes, uh, whether it be on area plans, uh, whether it be on the services that we provide and ensuring that the that learning outcomes are in those services as well. Uh, please continue to move forward with the reaffirmation process. Um, right now, there are over, there's 530 days until that compliance certification report is due in Atlanta. Um, that it, we're looking at topic selection that will a survey will be coming this fall. We will narrow our focus to the top uh, three themes. The next step will be the results of that survey. And then we will work with relevant stakeholders on those top themes. And we will have a topic by December, by the end of this fall semester, on how we will move forward in a pilot phase for uh, implementation for, for our next reaffirmation process. Some national surveys that we continue, Dr. Penley and the entire um, RAP division, um, Dr. K, everyone who's involved with this, but you see the tremendous amount of surveys that we, national surveys that we are involved in um, to make sure that we continue to uh, see the pulse of our students, be able to contribute to the research at a national level for community colleges. Um, the El Paso Collaborative for Academic Excellence, um, we have a data council that was established. Dr. K uh, is, is a liaison as well as Ms. Frescas and Angeles Vasquez. You see that we're participating with all of these different organizations for our community. I want to thank them for leading that uh, and for continuing uh, to move forward with the data council to ensure that all of us, the school districts, the college, the university, um, region 19, that we're all moving forward with this great data from from pre-K through 12, all the way through higher education and into the workforce, as you see, Workforce Solutions is also a part of this, as is Creed. So we continue to move forward and thank you for service on the Data Council. Let me talk a little bit about the return to campus operations. And I know that everyone is, is hesitant uh, and that we're gonna follow the data and the science. We're looking at five key data points that we continue to monitor on a regular basis that are in uh, the draft plan. And it's draft because the board has not voted to uh, have that be the college's plan. Um, we will continue to update the board and continue to refine this plan to a point where the board is ready to move forward with that. But the five metrics that we're looking at is a 14 day downward trajectory of cases. 
Um, we are currently meeting that benchmark, um, but 14 days that are less than the last 14 days. The rolling or moving seven day positivity rate average. We continue to monitor that. That is continued to be provided by um, the, the city and county. We're looking at that being less than or equal to 5%. And that has to continue for that 14 day period as well. We are finally under 5% on that moving day average, but we're not at the 14 days of continuous. The cumulative positivity rate for our community, uh, as of this morning, it was, uh, it was about 9%, um, which does meet, we're looking at it being less than or equal to 10%. A robust testing program, uh, the CDC and the government um, reopening plan indicates that for phase one, that we have to have tests from test to result be less than or equal to four days. We are not currently meeting that metric. Um, we are, we are, we continue to see delayed test results reported almost every day, which indicates that we are not meeting that four day threshold. We'll continue to monitor that. And finally, the infection rate for phase one, based on um, the city and county guidelines, we need to see 25 or fewer cases for every 100,000 people in our community. So that means that we need to see approximately 200 or fewer cases since the greater El Paso community is over 800,000 people. And so we need to continue to see that um, regularly. We will continue to monitor these metrics, continue to provide the board with an update. The next update will be on at the regular board meeting September 29th. In the interim, we need to continue to make sure that we are ready to go when we are looking at a return to campus and implementing the first phase. That means going through the proper training, identifying the phases, the staff that will be part of that, the alternating staff, each of the departments that are working on this, um, and ensuring that those workplaces are safe, um, that we have, for instance, plexiglass where it's needed and required, that those are established, that we have schedules where we will be able to be spread out well beyond the six feet, that we have um, indications, as you've seen, as you've walked into different stores, as I have, where you see the, the stickers on the floor that indicate six feet of spacing, so that if we do end up having any queues, any lines at any of our respective offices, that they are social distant. So we need to continue to prepare as we make recommendations to the board based on these five key data points. Um, the, health and, and the health and safety of our faculty, staff, and students remains paramount. We want to ensure that all college functions and services continue uninterrupted. So they may not be face-to-face, -face, but that they are uninterrupted and that they are online. Uh, we will continue that, to ensure that these are data-informed decisions that we began the process with that 14 day trajectory that we continue to monitor those items as I indicated. We will continue to present and update as well as seek board approval um, during future board meetings and you will see that those are obviously meetings that are broadcast and we will continue to keep the entire college community informed um, through the websites, through emails, through mass emails, general emails that go out from me. Uh, we'll continue to keep everyone informed on the status of the plan. Let me shift to the legislature. This is um, a base year and a base year indicates that it is also a legislative year. And so let me touch a bit on legislative and budget issues for the district. Um, here's where we are. So we continue to wait, um, and let's go back to the 86 session that, that was in 2019. We saw a very significant investment in public education, well-deserved. Um, they really, the legislature really poured dollars, billions of dollars into higher education, into public education and into our school districts. Uh, we were told that this would be a session that would focus more on higher education. And as a result, we were very um, bullish on the session. We were very hopeful for the session. 
obviously the pandemic has changed everything. Not only the safety, we don't know what meetings will look like. There have been no interim hearings that have been held um, for uh, the session since the pandemic began. Uh, the last interim hearing that I saw was was based on redistricting that we actually hosted at EPCC in the early spring term and back in January. We haven't seen any interim hearings, though, at the Capitol because the Capitol still remains closed. Governor Abbott has not opened the Capitol yet, and therefore there have not been any hearings that have been held. So we don't know what the session will look like that begins in January. But let me give you the information that I know and where we are from the Texas Association of Community Colleges based on directions that were received from the Legislative Budget Board, the LBB, through the Legislative Appropriations Request, the LAR, lots of acronyms. Um, we anticipated, obviously, the Comptroller has come out, um, uh, Comptroller Hager has come out, and then he was the first, one of the first who indicated way back in April that we were in a recession. Actually, the data indicates um, that we were in a depression and that we're now in a recession trying to come out of that recession. Um, there's a lot of work. Oh, is this going to be a V-shaped uh, recovery? Is it going to be a W-shaped recovery? Um, is it going to be a K-shaped recovery? There's lots of, lots of speculation. But here's where we are. The, the directions on the LER indicated that we could ask for as much funding as we received in 2019. So the 50 community colleges combined received $1.833.2 billion that was, um, that was issued amongst the 50 community colleges. You can see that on the chart. Um, it was $68 million of core operations or $1.368 million for each institution's student success points in the last session. We had recommended that they be funded at $215 per point. They ended up coming in at about $202 per point. Um, contact hours, you see there as well. Uh, there's only four institutions that receive a small amount of resources for, for bachelor's degrees, um, and you see that total. Initially, when we were told that this was a higher ed session, the 50 community colleges through the legislative committee um, had indicated that we were looking at um, increasing the core operations to $100 million or a um, uh, million dollars per institution, uh, $2 million over the biennium, a million dollars per year. Success points getting those back up to $215 a point. That would be an increase of $54.5 million. And since the legislative appropriations request directions were that we could not only ask for what we had, we took a corresponding that, that $86.5 million would be taken out of contact hours. What we saw in the summer is that contact hours enrollments grew for most community colleges and contact hours grew as well. For the fall, we are seeing a very different story. So for the fall, we are seeing that most community colleges, in fact, I only know of two institutions uh, that are showing growth and one institution, one of those two is showing growth of 1%. Um, so very small growth, but as a sector, we anticipate seeing actual declines and unfortunately declines in enrollment. And so that contact hour decline or reduction of $86.5 million dollars we believe may be actually um, mitigated by the enrollment decline. So that is our legislative uh, ask to the legislature. So you see it there. In addition to that legislative ask, we are asking for one exceptional item for the 50 community colleges, which would be a $1 million allocation per college to really focus on workforce, a workforce initiative to get many of the unemployed Texans, over 3 million Texans since the start of, of the pandemic have filed for unemployment, to help get them to, to reskill or upskill and get them back into the workforce as quickly as possible. But we also understand that we need to let the legislature know that we cannot continue to do more with less and that to, in order to stand up this initiative, that we needed to do, we needed a million dollars per institution to move that initiative forward. So that is our legislative update and our appropriations request. 
There'll be other policy items on transfer. There'll be policy items that we look at um, as in, in the session, but the funding request is the first and foremost of our priorities uh, that we look at for that. The budget, the adoption of the, of the 2020-21 operating budget was not an easy um, thing to do. Um, we had to go in understanding that uh, we were seeing, based on the enrollment trends, that we would see an enrollment decline. Uh, we budgeted for a 20% enrollment decline. We are fortunate that we actually saw a 10%. As of census date, we were down 10%, but contact hours were down about 13%. So we needed to budget taking that into consideration. Uh, we looked at the, at the possibility of a potential decrease in state appropriations this year. We were fortunately exempt from that. And then we also had to plan that, that we would see less in tax collection. Um, and that was based on people being out of work and the possibility that they may not be able to pay for their taxes. And so as a result, we wanted to make sure that we were ready and therefore, um, our final budget came in at 130, just under $138.2 million budget. That is about $7.5 million less than last year's budget. So all of you worked hard to make this budget work. I thank each of you. And let me say we did it without any uh, reductions in force or any furloughs. I'm very proud of that. I want to thank Vice President Shaughnessy, AVP Flores, uh, Ms. Deyes, uh, on the great work that they led, and each and every one of you on, on your cooperation and understanding of what we had to do with the budget. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I covered that. This is the budget. Um, as you can see, um, our largest contributor to the budget is local taxes um, at well over 44% of our budget. Um, State uh, appropriations and tuition and fees, um, you see them indicated there as well. Those are the next two items on our budget. Um, and then you see the other income and self-supporting self programs as well. Um, our expenditures, you can see uh, how we're spending all of those resources as well. Um, where instruction, um, you see institutional support, student services, all of the areas of the budget and how we spend those. When you look at categories, um, you see out of that $138 million budget, um, you see all of the faculty salary detail, our full-time and part-time salaries. Um, you see the staff, the full-time and, and part-time staff as well. Uh, you see each of the areas in the respective budget and how we spend that budget as well. Now, I know that that was hard, and I know that everyone sacrificed tremendously, and I know that the challenges are many. Uh, the challenges that we're dealing with with COVID-19, having to transition to a majority virtual environment, uh, the challenges of implementing a phased return to campus uh, plan and moving that forward, the budget challenges that we see, the challenges are many. But I'd be remiss if, uh, if I didn't feel this way and feel this way strongly. The work is too important. We have to move forward. Uh, we're going to do it safely. We're going to do it um, with uh, the, the safety and security of our faculty, staff, and students at the forefront. But the work is too important. We have to move forward. Higher education continues to be the surest path to the middle class. And the challenges that we see across our nation, um, higher education is the surest path to help us form a more perfect union. I firmly believe that in my heart of hearts. I know that each of you shares that with your commitment and passion to our institution. And I really believe that what's past is prologue. If I can borrow from Shakespeare or quote Shakespeare, at, if you look back to the, to the Great Recession that started in 2008, the Great Recession, from the depths of the Great Recession in 2008 through pre-pandemic, there was well over 12 million new jobs that were created in our country. Over 99% of those new jobs went to individuals with degrees and certificates. Higher education, and in particular what we do 
at community colleges and at El Paso Community College of providing that training, that education for a certificate or an associate's degree is going to be so important in getting out of this recession and the recovery and moving forward post pandemic. I firmly believe that and I look forward to working with each of you on making sure that that happens for our community, for our state, and ultimately for our nation. And the work that you do is so important. And I'd be remiss if I didn't end today's presentation without a, a most sincere thank you on behalf of myself and the Board of Trustees. Thank you for the amazing work that you do, for your flexibility, for your resilience, for your passion in serving and your dedication in serving the students that we are so privileged to enroll at El Paso Community College. Thank you so much. Have a great fall 2020. Please stay safe, please stay healthy, and I so look forward to seeing you in person in the near future. Thank you so much and have a great semester.